Welcome to Perspectives. Today we're going to be talking about what role, if any, does politics have in the church. And I'm here with my awesome colleagues, Jonathan and Russ. But first, before we get into it, I want to pose a quick question. If you had to vote for a new law or to abolish an existing law, what would it be? I think mine would be pretty easy. I would say that every car manufacturer has to build every car automatically with four-wheel drive. Because I don't have four-wheel drive because I'm too cheap to buy one, but if there was some sort of law where the cars had to come with it, then I wouldn't be stuck in on the side of the road every time it snows. Without making the cars more expensive to buy in the first place, right? Yeah, but I'd even be okay if just every car price went up just as long as it benefits me, you know what I'm saying? Oh. I, 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 I mean, ideally it wouldn't affect costs, but I, even though this is hypothetical, I'm, I'm trying to be as realistic, I feel like the car manufacturers would be like, okay, but we're gonna yeah. raise everything. So would we vote for his proposal? Yeah, absolutely, save lives, man. Save lives. Save, I, I would vote yes, just because coming from Ohio, flat, yeah. moving to Pittsburgh, it's terrifying driving around here sometimes, so yeah. I am pro-voting for four-wheel drive. Great. I'm going to office. All right. What about you, Jake? What's yours? I'd vote to limit the amount of superhero movies that can be made within one year <laughs> because I believe that it's ruining the film industry because it's just a formulaic approach to movie making. They know they're going to make a bunch of money and these original screenplays that they're not too sure about don't get aired because of these superhero movies. I love the Batman series with Christian Bale. Great movies. Other than that, Annex it. Love it. How well would you vote on that one? Uh, I'd vote for that. I've, I've, I have very strong opinions on creativity in the film industry. I feel like everything is a sequel, and it, it honestly just drives me crazy. We were watching um, the, the Spider-Man when they moved it under the Marvel umbrella just last weekend, and man, it just feels like they fit in like a Marvel reference to the other movies every five minutes, and it's like the film itself suffers because they're trying to cr just so hard to shoehorn everything into the, the, the cinematic universe. So um, I would vote for that. Yeah, I would say I would vote no. I would vote against, just because. I could tell, I could tell I, by the way you were. I love uh, Marvel too much that even if it's yeah. crappy, I, I get my fix. You get so much time back though, if they just limited. You can also just choose not to go see that particular <laughs> movie, you know, but. Okay. Mine is, uh, it goes against a lot of what I believe, but I find myself always wanting this more on this day, so I would vote that Chick-fil-A would have to be open at least for a few <laughs> hours on Sunday, um, especially like after church to, you know, let's say five o'clock. Uh, but no, uh, no more closed on Sunday, even though I believe in it being closed on Sunday. Yeah. It, it again, selfishly to my benefit, or anytime at least I went, mm -hmm. they had to be open and available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be, what would you guys vote on that one? I'd vote for that. That'd be, an, that'd be really hard to enforce. I think I agree. you're getting into some legal legal issues. What yeah. about you, Jake? I would vote for it because, you know, we work on Sundays and we have, <laughs> yeah. a, different, we have a different Sabbath. I wasn't going to so say it, but I'm glad you did. Yeah, NFL these, players, yeah. You know, these, uh, the yeah, these workers could have a different Sabbath day and I think it'd be it'd yeah. benefit everyone, really. Yeah. They'd Price, make more money. Chicken, you, know? Yeah. you know, community. Love it. I agree. Can I throw one more at you guys as a bonus? Um, since it is a leap year, I think we should get leap day off just as a federal holiday. It only comes every once every four years. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. come on. I like that. Let's get like a break. It. And get rid of daylight savings time while we're at it. I you know? changed mine. <laughs> I changed mine. I want that one. I thought we did vote for that at one point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, I think it's still in the court. Yeah, forget Chick-fil-A. Go back to Sunday off. No more daylight savings. Farmers, man. Our world Farmers. is so much better. We should be in charge of this thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> vote for us, 2024. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are we actually doing here, Jake? Well, I think first we, we could talk about what role politics has in the pulpit. Uh, how should the pastor, when creating sermons, interact with politics? Mm -hmm. Should he be partisan? Should he not be? How, how does he do that? Well, what's your guys' experience with that? Have you? I don't think I've really ever been a part of a church where the pastor is very explicitly left or right. I feel like from my, just my experience, um, whether we can label that as a positive or a negative, that's another question. But my experience has always been, it just seems like pastors are very like careful with their words and, and are very careful not to be, not to be partisan um, and sometimes just staying away from politics in general. But what's your guys' per, uh, experience? Uh, my, my personal experience is I don't 
I don't also have a whole lot of seeing it. Um, I think we're very, we're very fortunate, especially at a church like here, having been here almost two years or 10 years and just watching Kurt primarily, but um, you never get a true sense of, you know, what side he does or doesn't fall on. And I know you're going to kind of speak a little bit to this, but you, you, he sticks to uh, the primary purpose of what we believe teaching and preaching should be. Uh, but I have seen, at least through social media and clips um, of pastors and preachers being very, very upfront and direct and very one-sided and using the pulpit as a way to, you know, um, convince or communicate his stance on something that, you know, when I listen to it and watch it would completely isolate half the room if they didn't agree or believe or side with that particular side or party. So I have not personally experienced it, but I know based on what I've seen in the world that it is a very real thing that can be abused and taken advantage of um, if pastors choose to do that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, the pastor is not a partisan pawn in the political process. And when a moral issue... I know, uh, oh, the alliteration. Yeah, well, uh, when a moral issue or a political issue arises in the text, then the pastor shouldn't be afraid to speak to that if it's in the text. And um, it shouldn't be one leaning side or another. That, you know, if, if, you know, the text talks about political issues, so you can't say we have to avoid politics because Scripture talks about political issues. Mm -hmm. So when it arises in the text, we say what the text is saying unabashedly and without taking one side or the other. And I think Kurt does that well, to your point. Yeah, as we were even talking about this, that was the one sort of question in the back of my mind, is just as far as when we talk about relevancy and, and, and having sort of a, a relevant message. Relevancy is something you can sort of totally get off the rails with and just focus on being relevant. But you know what I mean, as far as um, when something really big happens in, in our world, um, it's very easy to, not easy, it's very, it's very easy to want to speak into that and, and think, I, I really need to sort of direct people's attention. But um, I'm even thinking about, you know, Kurt said something even about Israel, like, like, month, like um, in, in, in the past year. And, and you know, so I, so I guess that's to your point where it's like they're, we're, we're, we're starting from the Bible and addressing the political issue as opposed to just Kurt as an individual saying, well, this is what I think, this is what should be done. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, just a good, yeah. a good example of we want to be relevant. We don't, we don't want, if everyone in the room is thinking about a certain issue, we don't want to just pretend like it doesn't exist, but we always want to start with, like you said, the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, a word that gets thrown around a lot when you talk about politics and is agenda, and I don't think that uh, people should be using, you know, church on Sundays and, and you know, t the pulpit or the teaching platform or uh, the privilege to have all the attention on you and being responsible for shepherding a group of people in a community to bring your agenda, your personal views, your opinion. Like, you, the, the hope of the service is to look at the text, to look at the truth of God's Word and to let that dictate and to not bring you know, and that's, that's, I think, what happens and what we see and when it goes wrong is a particular or a party or a personal agenda gets infused into the text or assumed out of, taken out of context to set up what you think is, you know, truth. But um, I guess that's kind of what you were saying is that's the difference between your own personal agenda or letting the agenda be scripture itself not shying away like if it's in there we're going to address it and that's again what i think's unique about orchard hill and something i appreciate is we stick to the text we typically will look at a book and read through that book you know however long that takes and we don't skip over we don't ignore we don't overemphasize or highlight anything because it's to a particular personal agenda or opinion or, or party um, nor do we cater when or see like ooh, see this this would support this particular party, so let's let's over double down on this one to win the favor of. Does that make sense? What yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a skilled pastor will take it as an opportunity to blow up the idea of utopianism, to say that hey, your political party is not what's going to save you. 
that Jesus Christ is the one that provides salvation. Yeah, and you so, can't throw around multiple syllable words without defining it to us common folk over <laughs> utopianism. here. Utopianism. So, the peasants. Yeah, why don't you just define that word instead of just throwing it out there like Utopianism, everyone. like uh, a lot of people think that if their political party wins or if it were all their political party's agenda that was being put forth, then that would bring salvation. That would bring a better world, a utopian. And the pastor is going to come up and blow up that idea and say, you know, Scripture is not one political party. You can point to things in Scripture that would fit on the Republican side, some things fit on the Democratic side, and everything points to Jesus Christ as our ultimate salvation. And so it kind of blows up this idea of, hey, if my guy wins, then it'll be good. Or if this agenda gets put forth, then it'll be good. No. It'll be good when you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Well, why don't we move on to talking about groups, seeing as that we're all group directors, we all have some some sort of role in groups. So uh, maybe imagine, just off the top of my head, if, if, if someone in a group setting is extremely vocal about, um, and, and I, I don't mean politics in general, I mean their political party, um, seeing seeing it as sort of a utopia of sorts, um, how, how should we instruct you know group leaders uh, to um, to engage with that, because obviously we don't want them to just sort of um, disengage with that. Yeah. So we're, we're picturing a, a very vocal, mm -hmm. uh, partisan person putting forth their political agenda in a group setting? Yeah, the, the, the kind of person who just, no matter what the topic is, always seems to sort of get it back around to their hobby horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and I would imagine one that uh, happens pretty frequently uh, especially as we enter into, you know, various election years or season of elections. Like, I'm pretty sure we're going to be entering into one this year that's going to be hot and heated and debated. And, you know, it, it would be natural if people are doing life together and are passionate about things. And if politics is one of the things that you're passionate about, like, it would come up when someone asks, how you doing? How you feeling? What's what's new in your life? Um, and First off, I just want to say, like, that's that's okay. Like, if you're if you're very passionate about politics, like, there's there's nothing wrong with that. But it's it's figuring out and understanding what is the intention and purpose of uh, of what you're entering into. And what I mean by that is, in a in a group or study group setting, like, the intention or purpose of that group is not to get around and figure out who is on which side or what's the the p word you keep throwing around, partisan. You know, is that is that what that means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of you know what side you're on and get into argument. Like in a group setting, you're there to look at the word of God and let the word of God be the agenda, be the the purpose, be the hope that that's the thing that even if a Democrat and a Republican enter into the same study group, like what unites them, or actually what separates them is their their party belief, but what unites them should be their belief in the word of God, in, in Jesus Christ, in his saving grace and works, and um, don't lose sight of that. And I think sometimes what happens is we do lose sight of that, mm -hmm. and so we should be trying to keep that as the focus. Um, yeah. And well, being, and doing that, and saying that with, with truth and humility, you know, the same way that you get us going about should Marvel movies be, you know, I sense some real deep-seated passion <laughs> there in you that you have an opinion about that, you know, but we should never not be able to be in the same study group together because you feel so strongly about Marvel movies and I'm over here living my good life, enjoying every <laughs> one of them, you know. Um, is that, Sounds like a review. No, that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> a great point. But it was point. gentle and, hum a gen with gentle and humility. Did you I, see I, that? It brings up a great point because the, I think the, the current uh, cultural climate is that if, some, if, you, if someone disagrees or has the opposite viewpoint, then they're the enemy. And right. they're not treated with gentleness and respect. So in a group context, if I was the group leader and someone was pointing at their hobby horse and it's a political agenda kind of thing, I would listen to them, you know, respectfully. But if they keep bringing it up, I'd gently say, redirect them to the, the topic at hand and say, we respect your ideas. Some may have different ideas, but uh, like you said, we're going to point to the scripture and stay on track here. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so helpful that we... We have discussion questions. There is a structure to these groups. Uh, we would strongly insist that a group leader not just sit down and, you know, just sort of make it up as they go. But uh, when you have, I'm just thinking of our, our, our sermon review sort of study groups, 
Um, they have you know five to seven questions to go off of, and I've instructed our our young adult group leaders anytime that this has come up to you know if someone is consistently going a political route to just go back to the question and say okay, but how does that in, interact with the question? Because I'd say nine times out of ten, they're not really when you're bringing politics into it, you're not really interacting with the question. You're you're using the question as sort of a, a, a launching point to to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, but you have to ask yourself, is this, is this helpful to the group? Um, the golden question for our young adult groups is always, is, you know, we want people to take one step closer to Christ. Um, and so if you can genuinely say that this conversation is not leading us closer to that, um, we unabashedly would say it's, it's not appropriate for, for that setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, how would you guys expand that out outside of the, the group context, which kind of implies, at least in that setting, they're at least open to the idea of faith, desiring to grow deeper in their understanding uh, of, of the scriptures. But how, do, how would a Christian, a church member, you know, enter into the world where you step out of, now you're really into like the pressure and the heat and the, if you don't agree, you're the enemy. Yeah. How, how should we go about and try to interact with people who we know, if I'm on one side and they're on the other, how do we be Christ-like towards them? How do we spread and continue to share the gospel mm. with those folks? How do we walk into situations that we know might have an agenda mm-hmm. and, and keep to the, the, the truth of Scripture and, and the hope of us as we walk in faithfully with the Lord? Um, yeah. How do we just go about our daily lives knowing that this tension, this reality exists in pretty much every facet of our lives that mm-hmm. we go about. How would you guys? If I'm interacting with a stranger or you know at the gym or someone, instead of being in a group setting with other Christians, I think it moves more into the realm of apologetics and evangelism at that point. And so I want to be sure to not keep winning the argument at the top mm-hmm. of my priority ri- list instead of winning them to Christ. Mm-hmm. And so That's that good. takes humility, gentleness, saying you know really listening to them getting their viewpoint well enough so I can say it back to them in a way that they know that, all right, this guy heard me and understands, and then ask them questions. Try to open up the dialogue to point it to Christ, point it to asking them questions about what they believe about, you know, the nature of the universe and many different things. But if it's a political conversation, I think that's an opportunity to maybe do like the guy in the group does who points to his hobby horse and try to direct the, direct the conversation to something that's more impactful. Yeah. yeah, take a page out of their book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I I think just experience uh, working sort of outside of the church setting. I I, I always want to make sure that, especially w- with the the hot topics coming up in politics, especially traditional sexual ethics and defining sexual immorality the way that Christians do, which to the world is very narrow. I always want to make sure I'm, I'm connecting that to the gospel and connecting it to scripture. I want. I don't want them to be confused about why I believe what I believe. I want them to know I believe what I believe because it's it's biblical and it's because it's it's this is God's word and not because oh I I was raised in Kentucky which is a very you know sort of a red state or something. I want them to know that it's it's a religious perspective and not a, a purely political perspective. A, a religious perspective that will no doubt in, impact my political perspective. But we always want to make sure that we're. Um, we're looking at the telescope the right way, right? We're, 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 we're not looking at it in reverse to where we can't even actually see anything. We're not treating a telescope like a microscope. We're starting with the Bible and then we're zooming in on, on how does that impact mm-hmm. me as, as a, as a in, in the realm of politics, but as a political Christian. Mm-hmm. I think when I was younger too, I was more interested in sharing my biblical perspective and possibly winning the argument which oftentimes I think left the person with maybe you know an understanding of what the Christian perspective was, but not uh, a sweet taste in their mouth about the Christian person. Mm. And so I've, I've kind of stepped back with argument w- winning and moved forward with, um, hey, if I can have this person be heard and they feel loved and you know, there's more dialogue to be had there than just yeah. turning them off. Yeah, I mean, I... I agree with everything that you guys are saying, and I, I think there's an element to it too. You know, where we see in Scripture to be, to be in, but not of the world. And so, I think it's important that if if you call yourself a, a follower and you truly are a disciple of Christ, like people should be able to 
look at you and notice that there is something different about you. And we would know that that difference is Christ and, and the Holy Spirit at work in you. But I think a lot of times, and again, again, I could be stereotyping here, but it's what you see a lot on the news. It's what you see when you turn on different, you know, um, stations. And But people almost expect when you infuse politics into any scenario, they expect, you know, the tension to rise. They, they almost want to pick a fight. They want to be given a platform to state their case, rightly so. And I'm again, I'm not saying that's always a bad thing, but they're, they're almost expecting once they share theirs, if they know that you are opposite, that there's now going to be this feud. And I just want to pose the question of what should we be doing and what should it look like for believers to not allow us to be just like everyone else and to be sensitive and understanding. Um, you know, I, I think of, of Jesus when he walked into so many similar situations like this, like he almost never gave the people the reaction that they were expecting or anticipated and almost always would give like a uh, uh, response with questions, you know, and sometimes questions is the best way to diffuse or redirect, you know, even in a group setting, but just like Hey man, why you know why questions or you know uh, respond to them with questions and get them to maybe answer and see. Um, I, I don't know. I just I want to make sure that that was stated too. That just like we can't just always be falling into exactly what they were expecting and hoping. Like we want them to see Jesus in us, not our red or our blue. Yeah. They should see Christ first, and then you know. Because I, I think you could have a difference of opinion, and I could on who should be president, what you know, who should be doing this, what enact, what policies, and we can agree to disagree. But how we do that should matter, and how people seeing us do that should matter, and is part of our gospel witness. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, even sometimes that's pretty hard to do because we get excited and passionate about things. And um, does that make? Sense. Yeah, yeah. What comes to mind for me is disordered loves and identity. I think oftentimes now people's identity is so closely related to their political party. Mm. But if they can see us as Christians having properly ordered loves as God number one and maybe politics somewhere down here, they'll know that, okay, this guy has an opinion. He has thought about this, and he, but he's, he's talking about it in a way that you can tell that it's not, it doesn't have a hold of his heart. It's not his main thing that he's always thinking about because God's number one. And so yeah. he can have a friendly conversation and disagree while not getting angry and have a feud about it. Yeah. What do you think, Jonathan? Yeah, and I think that comes out um, with every election because in every election your candidate will either win or lose. Um, so when your candidate wins, are you, are, you, are you rubbing it in other people's faces? And, and when your candidate loses, are you depressed? And oh my goodness, the state of the world, I'm... I'm my, my tomorrow is going to be so much worse than my today, that kind of mentality. And so I think, I, think I, I really do like what you had to say about having that as your identity and, and having that be loud in the world and, and having people look at you and say, yeah, they're, they're in, interested in politics, but they're not, um, it, it, isn't, it, isn't defi- it isn't the defining thing. And going back to something you said earlier, Russ, about people who have a sort of a natural inclination in politics that... Um, I think, I think we need everyone, right? We need, the church has all kinds of people, and, and God has wired us all very differently. Yeah. And I think when you think of relevancy in the world, we, we want people like that to be showing how, um, how the Bible has a relevancy to our, to our everyday lives and how it is, it is instructing us. I think it would be uh, uh, moving the pendulum, the all, the, what am I trying to say? The, the total opposite way to say, well, I'm a Christian, so I can't have uh, a stance on these things. Correct. I think when we when we come across like, oh man, I'm clueless on these political issues. We come across like, well, the Bible is um, over here in the religious sphere, and then, but it, it never touches politics. I think when you show that they they do touch each other, that that gives non-believers a, a confidence in your worldview um, to say that your worldview actually matters in in, in the polit- political arena. The more I've studied. Um, different world religions. I've just been amazed at how many different worldviews really have nothing to say about some so some of the political things we're going through, you know, in the 21st century. But the more I've dived into my own faith, I've been really encouraged to see, like, 
the Bible is comprehensive. You know, God is the one who who wired the human heart, and so He's going to speak to to all these issues in one way or another. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think this conversation is can ha, has the potential to be to be really productive. And I think it's going to take um, conversations like these where people who maybe disagree a little bit more than we do, but people who are on the other sides of the aisle to be able to see each other with love and respect and mm-hmm. say, you know, I might dis- disagree with you, but that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're dumb. You know? <laughs> yeah. I might disagree with you, but that doesn't mean you're evil. You know, I mean, I think we just need to sort of um, start, start small with those small victories. Mm-hmm. I think, oh, Go ahead. sorry. If scripture, which it does, instructs us to pray for our leaders, mm-hmm. I mean, how, how would some of you feel if you were to pray for Donald Trump, if you were to pray for Joe Biden? Would you have a visceral reaction of repulsion to that? Well, the Bible instructs us to do it. So we can't have a viewpoint of either one of those people that says, I can't pray for that person. We We'd also should we'd... probably you know, state what specifically are you praying, you know, because there's probably people like, oh yeah, I'll pray. <laughs> but like, you know, be well-intentioned with your mm, prayers yeah, yeah, and yeah, godly, sure. uh, God-honoring. You know, people could take that and be like, oh, yeah, I'll pray. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that's what you meant, but, you know, yeah, probably should state you. that clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, no, I, I mean, I think both of you bring up a, a really good point in that, you know, I loved your, you know, at the end of the day, there's an, there's going to be an election and someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. And we shouldn't be like, ha, 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 you know, like, mm-hmm. because that shouldn't be what defines us. That shouldn't be where we're getting our sense of identity, our purpose, our meaning, our value. That should all come from Christ. It should be God is priority, and then somewhere down that list is politics. And for for different people, that, that's on a different rank on their list. Some people, that's number two, and that's, that's okay as long as it never becomes number one. And the other point that I love that you made was that uh, you have to see that politics is not separated or removed from God's word, from God's passion from his heart that God cares deeply to see the leaders of of nations of countries of people pursuing him and making decisions that have him in mind and his glory in mind and um, understanding that just because said party over here won the world is going to become great now to be able to say like even in myself I know that I have flaws and I have brokenness and I have sin and if it's true of me it's going to be true of the party that you know I identify with and this isn't the ultimate fix and so we are still in this together and my, my question was always like man how did we even get to this point where there is such division there is such animosity there is such tension mm-hmm. that if if that were to go away and we would remember who it is that we live for and who it is that we identify and get a purpose and what would it look like if they actually worked together. I'm, I'm okay with there being two primary teams, but you know, like, what would it look like to work together for the ultimate goal of pursuing Christ with all our hearts? But you know, you're not going to find that today, so how do we strive for that and push, you know, and remember Christ, what he's done for us, and our mission, which is ultimately to share the gospel with people and, and reflect Christ in all that we do, um, and just assume that we get a pass when it comes to politics to do whatever we want mm-hmm. because our party approves, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's a lot to think about, but I, I think there's some good points made here. And I um, hope so. I yeah. mean, I was I was nervous with the three of us getting together, but you know. But Russ told I think us we, earlier that if you have any questions, see him in the lobby to talk about politics. And I will redirect you <laughs> to uh, to Jake or Jonathan or you know someone else. Yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to email me at rbrasher at church.com. I'd love to yep. answer any of your questions. And I'll forward that to Jake Thede at, at, at Orchard Hill. Well, people church. can't spell my last name, so <laughs> that's all right. I'll I'll forward it. I'm, I'm okay. the one forwarding well, that's it. Nice. That's nice. You know. Gives me more opportunity. But no, to connect. I mean, yeah. Like just to wrap this up, I think it's important. We shouldn't, as Christians, be scared to have political conversations. We shouldn't be worried about you know what it might mean if said party wins and if said party loses, because we should know. At the end of the day, we know who's truly king. Amen. We know who wins. We know who rises the sun and and brings up the moon. Like, and so that I guess that's the other piece. If you go back to the pulpit, back to the group, back to our personal, like 
at the end of the day, who do we bend our knee to? Who do we worship mm -hmm. and truly see as in control, right. as ultimate, as the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega? Mm -hmm. That should, especially in the political world as Christians, take the pressure off mm -hmm. that even if the Democrats go into power, God is still in control. If the Republicans win and the president that you or the candidate that you didn't want to wins, you don't have to fold your life and just move to Canada. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, like we know who's in control. We know who's at work and we get to worship and serve him ultimately. And so there's that hope piece to that. There's that comfort. There's that identity. There's that uh, purpose. So. I think that's the one thing that we just ultimately can't forget. And I think that's what makes the pulpit easier is because you're not actually serving any other mm -hmm. king or agenda or, you know, party. You're you're serving the Lord. So well said. Yeah. Well said. All right. Good. Well, I think we should get See out of here. See you in the voting booth. Before we say anything, we, we <laughs> yeah. you know, might get in trouble for it. <laughs>